Father God, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you for um, the holiday that we just celebrated. Lord, we thank you not only for Christmas, but for the death, the burial, the resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that we can come before you and worship together. We thank you that we can worship in song. We thank you that we can worship through your word. We thank you, Lord, that um, we are able to gather freely. And we pray that we would have the passion to gather, gather even if it weren't so. Lord, we um, pray your blessing upon this time. Lord, you are the God who speaks. So we pray that you would speak, that you would speak through your word, that you would speak to our hearts, and that we would have the ears to listen. So, Father, we commit this to you. We commit this time to you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we... Um, James, turn it up just a little. We have uh, approached Jesus' condemnation of the religious leaders. We have gone through their rejection of him. And now we are at another kind of turning point as he is preparing to go to the cross. And Christ is at this point speaking with his disciples on the way out of the city and overlooking it. If you've seen the pictures of Jerusalem, many of them are taken from the Mount of Olives where you have a, a view of the city and of the Temple Mount from high up kind of overlooking. Jerusalem itself is originally built on a hill. You know, many cities were for protection, for defense, and those kinds of things. And if you can imagine Jesus sitting with his disciples as he looks over this hill, we will approach Matthew 24, and we will approach his discussion of the end. Now, this is something that a lot of people like to talk about these days, the end times. And we have to be careful when we approach that because it is important. What Jesus says is important. But it is also important that we remember that um, he does not give us the day or the hour, but he does give us some instruction. At the end of World War I, uh, the world became obsessed. And that obsession carried through and still is somewhat in play today, even though they've now scientifically proven otherwise. But the world was obsessed with the survival of one person. An interesting moment, an interesting thing. Could someone have survived? The Romanov family, which ruled Russia for um, the dynasty had been in place for a hundred or more years when the family was overthrown by the communist revolution, had been slaughtered. The, the family, several girls, a son, and the czar and his wife had been executed in a basement by the Communist Party. They had all been shot, they had been dumped down a mine shaft, their bodies covered in acid even, just trying to get rid of the evidence more or less. And the world was obsessed with the idea that one of their daughters, Anastasia, had somehow survived. Stories of it circulated. They had um, in one case, a gal who kind of popped out of nowhere that was a candidate for this being this person. The family sent um, a family tutor to examine and see if this person was actually her. There were arguments about, is this really the lost princess? Did she survive? Did someone have mercy on her? Did she make it through? 
And in that process, the question was asked over and over again, is this Anastasia? Over and over again, someone said, hey, I am, or that person is Anastasia. And in the end, scientific research, once they finally found the bodies, etc., was able to prove, no, she did not make it out. All these ones that popped up were fake. Whether someone was delusional or someone was purposely pretending. It never was her. So when we approach the end times and Jesus gives the warning that he's going to give, it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Look at chapter 24 of Matthew with me, if you would. And we could kind of entitle today's message, What the End is Not. Because before Jesus gives some specifics on what's going to happen at the end, he gives some things about what's not going to signal the end. As Jesus left and was going out of the temple complex, it says, in verse 1, his disciples came up and called his attention to the temple buildings. Then he replied to them, Don't you see all these things? I assure you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? What is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Then Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of birth pains. The first instruction that Jesus gives here is a private instruction. The public speaking is pretty much done. The disciples hear this comment as they're leaving, as they're walking away, as they can look down upon the city, and they are wondering what's going on. They come directly to the source. They've got him there. What does this mean? And they ask him, tell us when these things will happen. Verse 3, what is the sign of your coming? And the end of the age. You can feel their desire, their anticipation. These guys are still looking for the end. They're still looking for things to be set right. They don't totally understand, but they have also gotten some idea that he's going away and coming back. They have some idea that it's not all happening the way they originally thought it would. Their understanding is limited, but they understand more. Isn't that an amazing thing? They understand more. Have you ever felt like you were kind of blindly groping through your faith and, hey, I understand a little more. I don't understand everything I should, but I understand a little more. We start as a child. I understood one thing when I trusted Christ, that he had died for my sin, that he was alive, and that he would forgive me if I asked him. That's what I understood. As I come to know the Lord more, I understand more of his character. I understand more, but it's all based on that simple thing, right? His disciples have some of that understanding that's simple, but they're groping forward, looking for more. And Jesus reply in verse 6 does not exactly start to answer their question. Now, Jesus is famous for asking a question as an answer to a question. That was a very Jewish way to teach. It could also be a very frustrating way to learn sometimes. Because he makes you think it through, makes you come up with the answer, you know. But that's not the case here. You say, what's the sign? Have you ever wanted to look for the sign? 
Israel goes to war, things are happening around us. Country doesn't seem to be the way it used to be. There's frustration, there's fear, there's all sorts of things going on. Economically, things aren't quite what they ought to be. And we ask the question, is this the end times? Is this it? Well, Jesus' disciples, they can sense things winding up. And the question is, is this it? What is the sign? When are you coming back? When are these crazy things going to happen? How is the temple going to be torn apart? The temple would fall in about 40 years' time. In 70 AD, when the Romans burned it and tore it down, there's a part of finishing off the revolution in Palestine. But here, Jesus is talking and he's saying that's just a part of what's going to come. So what he starts with is interesting. Look at verse 6. Jesus replied to them, watch out. His reply is an instruction. It's not exactly an answer to the question yet, but it frames the answer to the question. His reply is not another question. His reply is a statement, a warning. Watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out so that no one deceives you. He's warning not just his disciples, but this warning carries down the ages. As we look around us and we go, is this the end? Have the end times begun? Well, we're one day closer. We don't know when. We're one day closer. Technically, the end times began the moment Christ ascended. But here we are. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. Isn't that a scary statement? Have we seen this? His answer, his warning, his instruction comes in a couple of chunks. The first one is watch out because false messiahs will come. Have we seen false messiahs come? It is amazing how many have come. It is amazing how many times they can be wrong and people still follow them. Joseph Smith made multiple predictions when he came. Multiple predictions that were wrong, that didn't happen, and yet people still followed him as he founded Mormonism. The Millerites, a group of people in robes out on a hill, waving at the sky, waiting for Christ's return because they had been told this was the day, this was when it would happen. And he never showed. And yet they still founded a whole other religious cult. There have been time and time again that people have said, look, he's over there. Look, he's over there. Look, I am here. And yet, it's not him. Jesus will give specific instructions on the signs of the end because people will know when he comes that it is him. But in the meantime, he tells his disciples, be wary. There will be a lot of fakes. There will be a lot of people who come along and say, I'm it. We have new truth. When someone says they have a deeper or newer truth, it always makes me twitch a little. It's scary because they're treading a dangerous line. If you actually look at, for instance, and I, I picked on Joseph Smith earlier, um, a piece of papyri that he carried with him. 
he actually had a couple of mummies that they took around with them, and he claimed that one of them, I believe, was Joseph. But they, they had this papyri, and he translated it when no one could translate hieroglyphics. And he translated it, and it, you know, basically bolstered his, his story, became a part of their scripture, and then it disappeared. It was found years later in Brigham Young University, and they translated it. And instead of being the Book of Moses, it was actually a piece of the Book of the Dead, re religious Egyptian burial rites, pagan rites. And the statement was made, well, he had a deeper meaning. Be careful with the deeper meaning. Be careful when you see these people test them because otherwise you will be deceived and this is not a sign the end is here guess what this is a sign that people are people that Satan is Satan and that deception is alive and well so when Jesus says, you know, as he winds up to his answer about when the end times will be, he says, start out with this. I will return, but in the meantime, many people will come in my name. Watch out for the false teaching. Watch out for those that say they're me. Be careful. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Believe it or not, the fact that people are fighting wars is not a sign that Christ is coming back today. It's a sign that we are sinful people who can't stop killing each other. Now, will those wars intensify? Yes. But look carefully at what he says. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. These things are going to happen. Don't be alarmed by them. What has Jesus basically said when they say, the Messiah is here. Anastasia is here. We, 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 we want to look for that person, right? We want things to happen a certain way. We want to see him come back. And so sometimes we can be taken in. But he says, don't be alarmed. This is one of the most interesting commands to me to Christian believers. In a world that seems completely gone wrong, don't be alarmed. Don't let this knock you off of your path, because these things will happen. Let me encourage you. What Christ is saying here, he's saying to his disciples, he's saying to us, watch out for the false teachers, hold firmly to the truth, and don't be frightened by what you see around you, because it's going to happen this way. This is the way it's going to be. Wars are going to happen. Rumors of wars. You're going to hear about things distant. There are going to be things up close. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And by the way, there will be other issues too. Famines and earthquakes. You know, it's funny, I read a list of things that somebody said, put out there that said, you know, 50 things they don't tell you before you move from Southern California. A couple of them were Los Angeles specific. I grew up in Southern California, but I was not a city kid. So I didn't get what he was talking about. And then, of course, you know, we got to the religious matters. For instance, that, you know, you would devour a cold in and out burger on a drop of a hat because you're a Southern Californian and it's in your blood and you just miss that. Well, one of the things that he said in there was, you'll miss earthquakes. 
can you imagine missing earthquakes? I kind of do. Not big ones, not disasters, just a little tremor now and then. I remember being in high school and I was at camp and we had a major earthquake. We had a, a 6.0 come a knocking that morning. We woke up and opened the door of our cabin and this humongous pine tree was doing this right in front of us. And I'm thinking, I don't think I want to be standing here much longer. And we had a couple little trimmers and it was done. And then that morning at breakfast, we had a 4.0 about three miles away, the epicenter. And we were rocking and rolling once again. We had chapel in a smaller building that night because they had to clear the larger buildings and the chapel had had some broken glass in it. We did, ended up taking a bus tour around town just to show the kids, I guess, that the world was still standing. Except a lot of people's chimneys weren't. The chimney had separated from the house and fallen down on numerous occasions. They say, earthquakes. I kind of miss them, just a little. But then I remember the destructive power of these things, and I remember as a kid experiencing an earthquake during the World Series in which some genius had designed a two-tier highway system in San Francisco, and the top went like that. And they were fishing people out of there. Most of them survived, but they were fishing them out of there for several days as they were crawling in and cutting them out of their cars. Not a good place to be. Yeah, I miss earthquakes out in the desert where there were no buildings to fall on me. I grew up a couple miles from the San Andreas Fault. You could see it from the sky, the dividing line in the ground. But Jesus says, these things are going to happen. Major famines, major disasters, earthquakes things we don't miss. Disasters that harm people and hurt them, that destroy property. Guess what? These will happen in various places. All these events are just the beginning of the end. These things aren't the things that signal I'm coming. These are just the beginning. And then he winds up and he starts going through a list of things that will ramp up and signal his coming. So in this passage, let me go back to this one phrase. See that you are not alarmed. Let me encourage you. Fear not. And not that statement of um, one pastor I was listening to, he got kind of agitated at a conference because the guy got up front, I guess, and started saying, you know, repeat after me, fear not. And he kind of went through every fear not that the Bible had, you know. And there are a lot of them. Because every time an angel appeared, he had to tell people not to be afraid. Every time God speaks to somebody, he has to tell them not to be afraid. Over and over again, he tells us not to be afraid, and this guy kind of, it went long apparently, and he also kind of worked the crowd up into a frenzy a little bit, and this guy was severely irritated with that because he said, of course we're going to fear, and we're going to screw up, and we're going to be afraid, and emphasizing the fear not without what follows it is a mistake. Well, what always follows the fear not? Because... There's always a because. Fear not because I bring you good tidings of great joy. Fear not because I am with you. Don't be alarmed because these things have to happen. It's just the beginning. There are other things to worry about. Don't be afraid. Because the Lord is with us. 
because these things will be happen because they are just the beginning of the birth pains. People have been theorizing time after time that this was it. World War I happened and they called it the war to end all wars because they thought that would end warfare permanently. The one group because they thought utopia was coming, the other group because they thought this was the end of the world. And then came World War II. It's just the beginning of birth pains. But don't be alarmed. Don't be deceived and don't be alarmed. These two things go together. As Christians, we should not be sitting here wringing our hands over the state of the world. We should be sharing the gospel. We should not be stopping what we're doing because tomorrow Jesus is coming and, or today and we're just going to sit here. No, he may come tomorrow. Be busy. You know, Derek and I were talking beforehand and he mentioned you know, managers sitting in a booth waiting, doing nothing, and then the boss comes and they all get busy and frantic. The boss is coming back, but we don't know when. Let us be about his business. But don't be alarmed. And don't be deceived. Don't fall for the fake Messiah because we're so longing for it all to be over or we're longing for power and position. We'll talk a little bit more about the 144,000 for instance as we talk about the end times but if you know anything about Jehovah's Witness theology they believe there are 144,000 that are chosen to rule with God. And what they've done is misquote a piece out of Revelation where he says that he will basically ordain, put his seal on 144,000 witnesses and send them out to the world. And in doing so, you know, these guys talked about, you know, earning your way into the 144,000, this, that, and the other. Be careful when people start to quote scripture because they like to misquote it. We've got to be very careful with it. And their point was, well, look, he's over here. Look, the truth is over there. We can gain this. We can be that. It's not what he said. He said, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come. In my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of these things. Don't be alarmed. Don't be deceived and don't be alarmed. These two things precede everything else that comes with end times. He will give them a warning. He will say, when you see X, Y, Z, head for the hills. But we'll get to that next time. In the meantime, Jesus says, don't be alarmed by the things that happen around you. Trust don't be deceived. Trust me. The underlying statement to his disciples is, trust in me before we talk about end time stuff. Understand and frame end times Jesus' return with the truth. I always love, by the way, how Hollywood thinks of Armageddon as some terrible thing that must be prevented at all costs. And in whatever movie they have with whatever cheesy plot line, Armageddon must be stopped. You know what Armageddon is? The battle against the king that will fail when he finally sets things truly right. As Christians, we should not fear the end times. We should look forward to the end. But in the meantime, there will be trouble. Don't be alarmed. Don't be deceived. Cling closely to the truth. Cling to him. And we will pick up in verse 9 next time as we 
I'm going to take into the signs of the end times when we talk about the Great Tribulation. When we talk about Christ's return. It'll take a couple weeks to get through it because these are pretty weighty things. But don't be alarmed. Don't be deceived. Trust the King. What an amazing promise we have with that. Let's close in a word of prayer.